I recently started a read through of the guide to the world of Greyhawk that you know the other book in the gold box and um, we're going to continue doing it today on Greyhawk Rognard. <music> So next up in the guide is the brief history of Eastern Orc um, with the chronological table of events, which is over here, and a brief history of Eastern Auric. So the, this is a really important part of the guide and the, it really sets the tone for the world of Greyhawk in general. Um, it really feels like somebody in the setting writing a history of what they feel are the most important things that make the that make the continent matter. Right? It's it's uh, it it goes from focusing on broad themes in the very beginning to focusing on something very specific and timely and topical at the end, which really feels natural to me. Um, first thing we we learn is that there are um, you know the the most reckoning is dated by common year CY. So when you see that the the World of Greyhawk is set in CY 576, when this book was supposedly published, um, that means common year. That uh, it, it's just one of the dating systems. We learn that there are five other dating systems, and we only know their um, uh, their initials. So I know you can't read this. Um, we've got SD for the Sulois, OC for Olven. Uh, which is Elvish. Uh, we'll get there in a sec. Um, BH, Baklouni, FT, Flane, and OR, Orid. Orid. Um, over the years, fans have come up with what those mean, um, and some of those fan definitions have been then canonized in later publications. But when this came out, we didn't know what those what those meant, and it just kind of gave it the air of ver verimus... Bleh, verim, verim, it made it feel more realistic because, <laughs> because um, this you, you get the impression that, of course, I don't need to explain what those mean. Uh, everybody knows. Um, it would, would be the, the thinking. Um, and it starts off with the migrations. And the migrations, here's the migration map. I'll see if I can make that. There we go. This is the the map of the migrations of of the of the folks on uh, in, into the Flannis, and that is something that's really uh, a central theme in in the setting. So the sharp-eyed among you will will realize that this is the version of this map that was in the original folio. They redid the map for the uh, for the guide, but this is what I have, and it's it's a pretty clear and and easy to follow diagram. So this is the one I'm I'm using for for this video. Um, we learned that the Sulois, um, the, down in the southeast there, um, the, the solid black line, uh, they started the migrations first, um, and this all happened, um, you know, quite some time ago, over a thousand years ago, uh, the, the Sulois, um, migrations, um, well, actually, the, um, the Oridian, uh, migrations, be, uh, begin, uh, first, and then the uh, the Sulois uh, migrations are uh, following, uh, which is which is an interesting thing, um, because in the text it implies that the Sul migrations start first, but in the timeline it it says that the Iridian Orid uh, migrations start first. So it's an, uh, I just noticed that was a uh, uh, a bit of a, a contradiction. Um, so basically, what you're seeing here is we got the Iridians who are kind of uh, caught between the Baklunish and the Sulois. Uh, the Sulois have this great empire, the Sulois Imperium. Uh, the Baklunish likewise uh, have an, an empire on, on the north and the Iridians are caught in the middle. Um, there is a great war between the Baklunish and the Sulois. Uh, humanoids are used as mercenaries. Um, the Iridians are caught up in the middle of it, and eventually the Iridians are pushed out of where they began, which is in what we call now the Dry Step, um, and and Ul and so forth. Um, and they start moving into the Flaness. Um, you can follow the dashed line; those are the Iridians, um, and you can see that in some places the Iridian um, and Sulois uh, migrations follow each other right so like down in what is now 
uh, Kaoland and so forth. We see this. And in fact, the Sulois are coming over the mountains. The Iridians are coming through the passes and they actually pass each other. So if you can notice that the arrows, the, the Sulois arrows are moving north and east, whereas the Iridian arrows are moving south and then east. So at some point they were actually moving in opposite directions, passing each other. And you get the impression that that was not a peaceful encounter. Um, then as they move into the Pomarge, they, they kind of move together. And um, they actually give, in the guide, in a couple pages later, they give mixtures of what races are in which countries. And you can see that this map really informs that. Because in places where you see Iridian and uh, Suloi's uh, lines moving together, the race, the racial stock in that country is a mix of the two, um, and, and which is I, I think a really neat uh, thing. And you can see some implied battles um, right here. For example, well, you can't really see it, uh, but you can't see where my cursor is. But um, where uh, in in what is now Valuna, right in the sort of near the middle, uh, you can see there's this Sulois. Uh, migration that goes north and then suddenly sharply bends back to the southeast. And right at where it bends, you can see that there is a Iridian uh, arrow right there. So I read that as, as meaning that the Sulois were moving up and then the Iridians found them and there was a big battle and that pushed the Sulois uh, away. So they, they kind of like uh, bonked into them and, and, and moved them. Um, the same thing happens up in the north. If you can see the Iridians and the Baklunish, um, they all uh, go up in the north and they're going east, 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 east. And then they come across this big blob of Flané uh, uh, peoples, the, the crosshatch section. And then both of them together sort of bounce back off of it. So they were admixing together. Then they encountered this big knot of Flan people and, and were repulsed by them. Uh, which I think is a very, a very cool thing. Um, we're told that the uh, Sulois were mostly driven to the south. So the jungle areas in Hetmanaland and the Amadeo jungle and, and, and so forth, you can see the arrows all going into those, er uh, into those areas down in the south. Um, that's where the majority of the Sulois people ended up, except for the strongest tribes, which ended up in, all the way up to the northeast. And you can see that really long sweeping arrow that goes from the, what is now the Sea of Dust all the way up to the northeast in the Theronian Peninsula. Um, that's that big Sulois migration where the, and that's where the, the northern Sul barbarians come from, uh, which is um, it's, it's, it's a very interesting dichotomy. You have the, uh, you know, most of them are in the, the steaming jungles, except for this one great uh, branch of the, of the Sulois uh, race, which is up there in the north, um, which eventually becomes their kind of Viking-esque uh, thing. But the majority of inhabitants of the of the Flaness, as you can see, are either Iridians, especially up there in that north in that central section north of the Near Dive, um, or a mix of Iridian and Sulois in various uh, things, especially out into the east into the Great Kingdom, uh, where it's mostly Iridians with a little bit of Sulois. And I just think I like this uh, this map a lot. It really lends a lot of flavor and color to the um, you know to the setting. So I'm, I'm, I'm very, uh, very happy about this. But I, am, I love the fact that you can kind of imply some of the history from the arrows and the, and the lines themselves. I think that's a really nice touch. Now, another part of this section is this wonderful uh, timeline. And you can see it gives all the dates in the, all five, uh, six different um, uh, uh, dating systems, but it gives a whole list of all these uh, events that we know next to nothing about as when this was written. So, you know, so we have the, um, the battle of a fortnight's length. We know in the text that that was some big battle that, uh, was fought between Erdi and, uh, Furiondi. But, um, other than that, we, I, I'm sorry, uh, between that and Nyrond, um, which brought Nyrond into the great kingdom. But other than that, we don't know any details about the battle itself. Um, we know when the demi-human uh, countries, Ulic and Selene, were created. Um, we know when um, Horn Society came and when the Pomarge was established. You know, so we, we, we get these, we, these nice little tidbits. Some of these events are referred to later on in the individual country or, or uh, 
geographical feature descriptions, but we, you know, it's nice to have them all laid out here and know exactly when they happen so you don't have to do a lot of math. Um, some parts of this are then contradicted by later things. There's some of the, some of the timing doesn't quite work out, um, especially with uh, Ayus and the Temple of Elemental Evil. The, the, the dates doesn't, doesn't quite work, uh, but you know, it's still nice to, to have uh, something like this. Now, after the the migrations and the establishment of the Great Kingdom and so forth, because essentially the Great Kingdom ruled the entire Flaness from the eastern coast, from the uh, the eastern coast all the way over to like Perrinland. So the, the that entire swath of the Flaness, everything except basically Kaoland and the extreme north, was part of this Great Kingdom, and everything was peaceful and nice. And then Eventually, gradually, the different um, states along the periphery wanted their own independence. So Perrinland and Valuna and, and, and Furiandi and, and places like that, you know, they started to break away. And eventually the Great Kingdom was paired back to what we see in the, in the gold box, which is basically, it's still huge. It's still the largest country in the, in the continent, but it's much smaller than it used to be. So we get a little bit of that history. We know that, you know, they gradually decline, the, the rulers of the Great Kingdom gradually decline into madness and, and demonology and things like that. Um, but then we get an entire page that basically sets the stage for the Temple of Elemental Evil. Um, it's a recap of the events of that, you know, of the background, um, which tells me that this was written at a time when Gygax was very much doing his Village of Hamlet Temple of Elemental Evil campaign for his own players. Um, because it's very, you know, it's, it wouldn't be so prominent if it wasn't something that he was actively working on at the time, I think. Um, you know, so we get a, a, a very big description, a very detailed description of the Battle of Emerdy Meadows, uh, of the rise of the temple, of um, uh, the dis besieging and the um, imprisonment of Zukmoy and so forth, the disappearance of, of Prince Thrommel, um, you know, all this, you know, really... Uh, it, it's interesting to see that much detail and it's almost an entire page in what is supposed to be a, a guide to an entire continent um, is given for one module essentially um, so I, I, I think that I'm not sure I would con I would say that this is like a, a marketing thing per se I think it's just because this was what Gygax was working on at the time so it made sense to put that much emphasis on it and use that as his example of the fact that, uh, you know, good is still uh, a force in the Flaness. Um, one last uh, thing I'm going to do, and then we'll, we'll call it for today. Uh, we have an examination of populations, um, which is a little bit different than what we saw earlier about the population of, of you know, with the sizes of different settlements. Um, <clears throat> this gives you, you know, where you're going to find towns and villages and stuff. Um, uh, some uh, communities are nearly always located on a waterway, road, or coast. Uh, some small settlements occur in wilderness where some produce resource or, uh, or something gives the most uh, reason for habitation. These communities are mostly th uh, thickly settled in agricultural areas. Um, it gives uh, you know the different kinds of fortifications between rulers, his liegemen, military forts, um, independent uh, fortified uh, locations and and so forth you know it, it, it it's worth rereading all that uh, section about you know where you're gonna find things um, if only to give yourself um, as a DM uh, some good inspiration on what you know, on how to do things um, gives you where the humanoids are one interesting little note I found here um, is uh, uh, only I use the horn society and portions of the great kingdom allow the more civilized humanoids to dwell among the human folk um, I'm guessing by the more civilized, they mean the lawful evil ones, like orcs, um, rather than the chaotic evil ones, uh, like gnolls. Um, the large free cities, such as Greyhawk, uh, are also known to allow various sorts of humanoids free access to their precincts. I find that absolutely fascinating. That's something you also see uh, a lot of in uh, older city um 
products back in uh, in the 70s and 80s. Judges Guild did that a lot. You know, there were a lot of orcs in this in the city state of the uh, World Emperor and Invincible Overlord and so forth. Um, you know, you see that in some of the more independent things. So this is definitely uh, you know having orcs and other humanoids in the cities was a thing back then, and and it's it's interesting to see it noted. Um, and then it talks about roads and trails and tracks and so forth, um, and and and. and you know, rounds it out. So on the whole, uh, I, I find this a very uh, both inspiring and pr practical, uh, useful um, uh, section of the of the book. So anyway, that's what we got for today. Let me know what you think of uh, all this stuff in the comments. Um, like I said, I won't be doing these. Uh, I'm not going to be doing a straight run through of this as other topics come up. I'm going to do them and we'll come back to this, but, um, I'm enjoying, uh, doing this read through it, you know, helps refresh, uh, my memory on what all the, uh, all, all the different things that get covered and the level of detail and depth that you see in the book. So anyway, hope you're enjoying it. Let me know what you think and I will talk to you later. Thanks for watching today's video. Please remember to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Below you'll find links to my Patreon which helps make these videos possible. You'll also find the web store where you can buy my books, and my blog where you'll find all sorts of free downloads and other articles. Thanks and have a great day.